Five. So tonight we will be finishing all of chapter five. And you heard me right. You heard me right. Uh, there are, we are basically two different prophecies. Um, and the dating for them, excuse me, the dating for them is pretty much before Babylon attacked. So basically the same as the as other chapters so far. There hasn't been that that wide of a time variation between all the prophecies we looked at so far. Um, that's about to change though in chapter seven. And then we start going more more sporadic. Uh, and it was either probably um, before King Josiah's religious reform or just after he died in 609 and Babylon came in 605. So uh, maybe in one of those two areas. The theme of the first prophecy is uh, punishment for Jerusalem's sin. Obviously kind of been the theme for most of the things we've been looking at. Uh, and then the second one is uh, that they didn't have any fear of the Lord. So we will get started there. Uh, Nicole, you want to read that? Rome. Through, oh, Rome. Yeah, Rome. Through the streets of Jerusalem. Investigate, search in her squares. If you find one person who acts justly, who pursues faithfulness, then I will forgive her. When they say, as the Lord lives, they are swearing falsely. Lord, don't your eyes look for faithfulness? <coughs> you have struck them, but they felt no pain. You have finished them off, but they refuse to accept discipline. They made their faces harder than rock, and they refuse to return. So the idea here is they're just getting bitter and, and, and they're not refusing to listen to God. Obviously, that was kind of clear. But there's one part here that's kind of unclear. It says here, Lord, don't don't your eyes look for faithfulness. That kind of just seems to be out of nowhere. The idea is something more like this. They're swearing falsely be, because the Lord looks for faithfulness and they're not having faithfulness, but they're swearing according to God. It, it kind of doesn't really fit there in English very well. When they say, as the Lord lives, they're swearing falsely because the Lord is looking for faithfulness and you guys aren't being faithful to him. It's something that just... I just kind of hate how some of the English translations read on stuff. What are you going to do, right? Uh, Gracie, can you read that one? And then I thought it was they are just the poor. They have been foolish, for they don't understand the way the lo of the Lord, the justice of their God. I will go to the powerful and speak to them. Surely they know the way of the Lord, uh, the justice of their God. However, the, uh, these also had broken the yoke and horns off the king. Therefore a lion from the forest will strike them down. A wolf from um, arid. arid plain will uh, ravage them. A leopard stalk uh, their cities. Anyone who leaves them will be torn to pieces because their rebellious acts are many. So there's a lot of things going on here that I kind of need to explain. The first thing is this at the beginning. Then I thought, hey, they're just the poor. They've been foolish. And the idea here is that um, he was trying to reason it away with something like this. Maybe the poor can be excused for, for their sin because of their circumstances. Maybe they were just in a tight place and that's why they're acting wickedly. Like, you know, how somebody who's starving will steal food. And you can kind of – it's not necessarily that stealing is right, but – you can kind of, you know, see where it came from. And it seems like that's what he's kind of trying to say. But the powerful, though, he, he he went to the poor. That didn't work out. So he went to the powerful, but that still didn't work out because they <laughs> they definitely weren't righteous. And it says here, um, this is a little bit of a uh, an irony. And Jeremiah, especially if you read it in Hebrew, is filled with a lot of word plays and a lot of irony. And this one actually comes across pretty well. He says here, uh, where was the line? Uh, however, uh, these old, these also had broken the yoke and torn off the chains. It, it, this is irony because they they cast off their servitude to God. You know, even though they were His people, ah, no, no, we're not going to really listen to Him and, and obey Him. Um, but at the same time, their punishment for that would be that they would be taken into exile, where they'd be put into chains. So it's kind of like this. I guess you could call it dramatic irony. Uh, and then right here, uh, there's another part that just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Therefore, a lion from the forest will strike them down, a wolf from airplanes. And the idea here is that no matter where they go, disasters are going to overtake them. Look at look at the different things. It says a lion, a wolf, and okay, all right. But look at what it says about that. The, in the forest, in the arid plains or the desert, and in the city. So basically, anywhere that they go, the disaster is going to overtake them. Uh, Dylan, can you read that? Why should I forgive you when your children have abandoned me and sworn by those who are not gods? I satisfied their needs, yet they committed all adultery. They gathered themselves at the prostitute's house. They are well-fed, eager stallions, each neighing after someone else's wife. 
Should I not punish them for these things? This is the Lord's declaration. Declaration, okay. Uh, should I not at avenge myself on such a nation as this? Hey, I just want to take a real quick note and say, hey, Dylan got through there through that without any like laughing or anything about the whole prostitutes thing. So hey, good job, Dylan. <laughs> you did it, buddy. <laughs> I'm proud of you. <laughs> um, so the CSB, there's um, you might read it at your house in your own translation, a little bit different. Um, I had to actually alter this translation, um, kind of retranslate it to make more sense for us tonight. Uh, the CSB reads, they gashed themselves at the prostitute's house, but that, yeah, it doesn't, it could, that's, the word could mean that, but it just doesn't really seem to, like that's what's, what's going on. Um, it, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, that translation. So I changed it to, they gathered themselves, and that's what the NASB says, and the NIV and I think there's another one too. Uh, so, let's see. Okay, and then that takes us to 5, 10 through 13. Eli, if you could get that. Go up amongst her vineyard. Ter terrace? Terraces? Terraces and destroy them, but do not finish them off. Do you know what like a terrace is? No. It's like where, the, where, they, where they make the vineyards, how they, how they do that to the ground. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah. prune, prune away her, shoot, her shoots. For they do not belong to the Lord. They, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, have dealt very treacherously with me. This is Lord's dec dec declaration. They have contacted, contradicted, contradicted the Lord, and instead, it won't happen. Harm won't come to us. We won't see sword or famine. The prophets become only wind for the Lord to pour it is night on them. This will, in fact, happen to them. So it's kind of interesting because many modern Westerners feel the exact same thing now. Everything's going to be fine. Nothing bad will happen. And the, the, the funny thing is, so the Bible tells us that things aren't going to be kosher, that things are definitely going to go, going to go bad because we're living in the end times. Yeah. And then there's, we have these other people saying, no, everything's going to be totally fine. And then we even have people who are not prophets, people who are... Um, atheists in a lot of cases saying the exact same thing. We have all these, you know, these people talking about climate change and the wars and like Russia and Ukraine and all this different stuff and all the glo all the global famine that's going on. And these aren't even Christian people. They're just saying, hey, <laughs> bad times ahead. And uh, it's it's kind of funny that um, you know for for many there is still that uh, hesitancy to believe in what the Bible says. It's like, oh no, you know, everything's going to be fine. And I think that part of it is just living in denial. But also, it's it's worth noticing that um, right here, he talks about go up among her vineyard terraces and destroy them, but do not finish them off. Prune away her shoots, for they do not belong to the Lord. And this is actually something that Paul references um, about how the, the the branch of or the vine of um, of Israel was being pruned, and the Gentiles were grafted in, the non Jews were grafted in. Um, and Paul and, 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 and Jesus both talk about that. And uh, I, I, I'm, I believe that it's a reference to this passage in Jeremiah. I, I might be wrong, but I was reading, excuse me, I was reading through what Jesus said and what Paul wrote in Romans and then reading this and just really seems like that's where they were, uh, where they were citing, if you will. Uh, so, Josie, could you get that one? Uh, Therefore, this is what the Lord God of armies said. Because you have spoken this word, I'm going to make you my words become fire in your mouth. I'm going to make my words become fire in your mouth. These people are the wood, and the fire will consume them. I'm about to bring a nation. I'm about to bring a nation from far away against you, house of Israel. This is the Lord's declaration. It is an established nation, nation, an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, and whose speech you do not understand. Their quiver is like an open grave. They're all warriors. So let me kind of explain some of the things going on here. Uh, God was going to, if you notice that the first thing it says here, because you have spoken this word, I'm going to make my words become fire in your mouth. Um, the God would actually judge them harsher because of their false words and their improper reaction. So basically what I mean by improper reaction is God said, hey, bad news bears, you guys need to stop doing what you're doing. And they said, yeah, we're not going to listen to you. So that's an improper reaction to a warning from God. It's like basically if a cop said, look, I'm not going to give you a ticket, but you really need to stop start driving a little bit slower. And then you say, no, I'm not really going to do that. And so then he gives you a ticket anyways. You know see what I mean? Like it's just one of those things that that's, that's, a, that's a wrong reaction. And uh, so God was actually going to judge them harsher because they were giving false words. He said, hey, you guys need to knock it off. And then other people say, nah, it's going to be fine. 
and then say, okay, yeah, well, this guy says it's going to be fine, so that means it's going to be fine. Um, then another thing, it says that uh, the nation that's coming against him is an ancient nation, and I told you guys before that Babylon came to rise after Assyria. So what's the deal there? Well, Babylon was actually one of the first empires. Um, maybe you guys in, in, in your history classes have ever heard of Hammurabi. Um, that was the old Babylonian empire. So Babylon was one of the first empires. It had fallen, but it had come back. So um, its roots were ancient. And then the last thing that kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense here is it says their quiver is like an open, gra open grave. So a quiver is, you know, obviously where you store arrows if you're into archery, if you shoot bows. Uh, but the idea here is their, their quiver being an open grave, uh, many would die. They, they were trained warriors. They knew what they were doing. People were in it wiped out. Um, Nicole, can you read that? They will consume your harvest and your food. They will consume your sons and your daughters. They will consume your flocks and herds. They will consume your vines and your fig trees. With the sword, they will destroy your fortified cities in which you trust. But even in those days, this is the Lord's declaration. I will not finish you off. When people ask, for what offense has the Lord our God done all these things to us? You will respond to them, just as you abandoned me and served foreign gods in your land. So will you serve strangers in a land that is not yours? So that is the end of this, the first prophecy that we're looking at. And basically, um, what he's talking about here is, is just the mass devastation that's going to come. When Babylon comes, they're going to destroy, kill, recruit, obviously soldiers for the army, uh, still eat the crops. I mean, it's just going to be like when locusts come on crops. It's just... Um, but if you notice a couple times there, he talked about not just the judgment, but he talked about the coming hope too. Uh, for instance, this part right here where he says, um, even in those days, this is the Lord's declaration, like to, to verify, hey, absolutely what I'm about to say here, I will not finish you off in those days. So uh, God's promise of mercy and, uh, uh, is throughout it, but also uh, throughout this, this prophecy that we've read, there are a, a quite a few allusions to the coming covenant under uh, Jesus. Jeremiah is, as far as I'm aware, is the most, mo I believe it's the most dominant uh, prophet which mentions Jesus repeatedly. Uh, Isaiah mentions him, obviously the, the suffering servant, you know, talking about, you know, the one who will be, um, who will bleed for us and all that. But Jeremiah talks more in terms of the covenant, and whereas Isaiah focuses more on um, the, ser the suffering servant himself. Okay, so even though God told them not to, they, they served the the, uh, the other gods because they wanted to live their best life, you know. So now they would serve those who didn't want to, and irony of the freedom of sin. We always, And what I mean by the irony of the freedom of sin is we always have this idea that if we live our life on our terms and do what we want, we're going to be free and have fun. But we never are. It only brings more bondage, more suffering, more pain, and more destruction. And, uh, you know, that was true back then. That's still true today. So uh, in wrapping up this prophecy... Um, it's important to note that God allowed or caused, however you want to say that, uh, the punishment because they deserved it. So how could God allow this to happen? How could God possibly allow the bad things to happen? Uh, well, cause, like, if good things happen, then you would just continue to do that. So. Okay, so you're saying if God didn't bring the bad things, there would be no lesson. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? No, that's a good thing. Yeah. I, I agree. It's like with your kids, you, if you don't discipline them, they'll just, you know, well, get worse and worse. You know, so like in what was his name where he killed like his whole, whole family? And, and he was like, when Jesus continued to follow God, he had to like go and be mad at him and all that stuff. He continued to just. I'm not quite sure who you're talking about. Well, like. Are you talking about Job? Is that where he was? Was it Job? You're talking about where the Are you talking died? about where, where, where Job's family died? And he continued to serve God? Yeah. Okay, all right. I thought you were saying a person who went and killed his family no. and then was serving God. And I was like, I don't think that sounds very much like serving God. <laughs> but yeah, okay. So uh, Jeremiah's answer to that question of how could God allow this to happen, how could a good God allow these bad things to happen, was simply that they deserved it. They were, they were sinning. They wouldn't stop. They deserved it. That was that was Jeremiah's answer to this to this whole dilemma. And, uh, you know, something that Chuck said in a sermon a couple weeks back, and I think that it very much so applies— Everyone will die. He just shortened their lives. We have these big, big calamities that come, like maybe a tsunami or a hurricane or whatever, and it kills a lot of people all at once. And we think, oh, God, you have to give an explanation about this. But the truth is that all those people are going to die. They just died at one time rather than dying over the span of the next 50 or so years. 
See what I mean? Like, it's not like something immoral happened. It would have been immoral if they wouldn't have died in the first place. But they were going to die. God just used their death as a sign. Like, hey, here's a here's a here's something for you guys to stick in your pipe and smoke it. I'm shortening their lives because they're disobeying. So, uh, a question that God asks in the pat in the prophecies that we were just reading is, why should I forgive? Why should God forgive? And there was no reason to forgive because they wanted to live their truth. They didn't want to live, live by God's standards. They didn't want to grow or change. They wanted to live their truth. So why should God forgive that when that's what they wanted? And uh, there was no reason not to punish them, to hold back and be merciful to them, uh, since they did nothing but sin and wouldn't change. He had given them time to change. They obviously gave their answer. <laughs> We're talking about generations later. It's not like God, you know, is this wrathful God that's just waiting to wipe people out. I mean, he gave them plenty of time, and they just, they, they wouldn't. And though I noticed that people who complain about God, God being wrathful are people who are not repenting now. You know what I mean? And so God gives us opportunities, and we say, God, how could you possibly say that Jesus is the only way when all those people have never heard about Jesus? It's like, well, you've heard about Jesus, and you're not accepting. So under that rule, I mean, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So I thought God loved everybody. I thought God was love. And here's the thing. You know, a lot of people will tell you, oh, he wouldn't do this, or he wouldn't do that because he is love and all this. Because God loves, he disciplines. He cannot ignore evil. It is impossible to be a good God and ignore evil. That's impossible. Um, think of a judge who sees a mother and father having children, beating them to death, having another child, beating them to death, and then not doing anything about it. Like, oh, no, that's fine. Would you say that as a good judge or would you say that as a bad judge? Well, I think we can all agree that that would be ludicrous if he didn't. So how much more so God, the ruler of all the universe, if he just said, you know what, it's totally fine. You guys did the wrong thing, and it's cool. It's on me. It's it's not, though. Um, if God really loves us, he will be just. He will discipline. He will reprimand and, and punish and, and bring correction if God really does love us. We have this idea that, that love has to always be pleasant and happy, and that's not overly true. That's that's just really not true. Um, think about uh, a husband and wife who, who get in a, who get in an argument, and uh, you know they, it's not like they're going to divorce or anything, but I mean they still love each other. They just have a disagreement. It's kind of like that. Like love isn't always <laughs> rainbows and butterflies all the time. Um, so, but weren't there some who were righteous in the city? I mean, what about Jeremiah? Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Jeremiah wasn't counted in the righteous people in the city because he was the one, the speaker that God chose to go to Israel to look for the righteous person. <laughs> so that doesn't count. <laughs> like, like, hey, um, Gracie, I'm going to have you go to uh, go to the Creo's house and see if there's any girls there. Well, you don't count because you're the one going to check. It's the same basic idea. So uh, let's see what else. Um, what about King Josiah? Wasn't he righteous? Well, here's the thing. First off, this prophecy might have been given before he had his reformation, or it could have been given after he died. I already mentioned that. But assuming that he is alive, he would die before the judgment came. And the task was to look for regular people, not to go and find the king who was serving God. That's why it says very clearly that he went into the city and looked at the poor, didn't find any righteous there. So then he went to the wealthy, didn't find any righteous there. The goal wasn't to go find Josiah, who was instigating the reform. The goal was to find people in Jerusalem who who who, who were good people, or who were doing the right thing, I guess you could say, who were righteous. Uh, and then the last thing here that I want to mention about this prophecy they looked at, um, they looked righteous with the things that they said. Um, you know, or actually, I have two more things. I just said that this is the last thing I want to say about the prophecy. It's not. I didn't scroll down. Um, they were saying, as the Lord lives, which was was kind of like a way of, of, of making a promise or like um, um, kind of speaking with, it's kind of, how, how could we describe it with today? Um, kind of taking an oath on the Lord's name, kind of, sort of. Um, and so that, that made them look the part of being righteous because they were saying the right things. But God puts a line between the appearance and what is inside. See, we can fool people with our appearance. I can make you guys think that I'm a pretty good guy or whatever, right? Yeah. But God sees what's actually in the heart, and he sees what other people don't see, and he sees what we hide from other people. And so even though they were saying things that made them look righteous, look like good, godly people, what was inside was not that. 
Um, and so I also want to mention that God wasn't looking for someone who did a good thing. Even the most wicked of people do a good thing. You know, even Hitler did good, did some good things. I'm not saying the majority of what he did was good, but he did over the period of his life do at least one good thing. However, it was the idea of consistently doing the right thing. And then the, this for real is the last thing I want to say about this prophecy. The people who didn't listen would complain to Jeremiah. And this is, this you got to imagine just how funny this is. So, you know, Jeremiah is trying to warn them and they're like, no, nah, I'm not going to listen. So then when the bad things happen, God tells them they're going to come and they're going to complain to you. Why is this happening, Jeremiah? And uh, so then, you know, for, they even, they, the, even the way that they say it, for what offense has God decided to do this? <laughs> and uh, God told Jeremiah that he was specifically commanded to tell them a certain message when they did. And this was basically it. You abandoned and served foreign gods. So now this is happening as punishment. He literally had to reiterate what he'd been saying for years when they hadn't listened listened in the first place. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you got to laugh at some of the stuff that, that, that goes on. But anyways, well, you don't have to laugh, but I would like it if you did. Uh, Gracie, can you read this? I declare this in the house of Jacob, proclaim it in Judah, saying, Hear this, you foolish and sinful people. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but, do they, um, but they don't hear. Um, do you not fear me? This is the Lord's declaration. Um, do you not tremble before me? The one who set the sand as the boundary of the sea, an enduring uh, boundary um, barrier that is um, that it cannot cross. The waves surge, but they cannot prevail. They roar, but cannot pass over it. Um, but these people have stub um, have stubborn and religious hearts. Rebellious. Oh, sorry. Rebellious hearts. Um, they have turned aside and gone away. So this is the second prophecy that we're going to look at. It's the second one in chapter uh, 5. And uh, he says here something that I want to kind of highlight. He says, you foolish and senseless people. And he said, they have eyes, but they don't see. Um, he's not... Um, let me start at the beginning. They they keep doing the wrong thing, expecting an, a different outcome. The, you've you've probably heard people say um, the definition of insanity: doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's exactly what's happening. They they keep doing the same thing, and they're expecting something different to come from it. Like I'm going to keep living my life on my terms, and then somehow it's all going to work out, and I'm going to live my best life, and everything's going to be going to be great. And God keeps trying to tell them, no, that's that, that's really not what's going to happen. You know, and, and the whole time, it's like, I think of it like somebody who says, that guardrail is just put up to stop me from having fun. And so they take their car and they drive it over the car guardrail and go over the cliff, and then they die. That's exactly what's happening here with, with God. He's saying, okay, look, I'm trying a bit of a barrier here, so you understand this is for your own good. This is not this is not a good thing that's happening. And they just continually saying, no, I think, I, think it's, I think my best life is over that guardrail. I think you're holding me back from fun and happiness. I, I think I need to go there. So then they're doing it, and the whole time bad things are happening. So uh, a good example of this is what people do oftentimes. You, I, I see this as, as a pastor. I've seen this quite a bit. People sleeping around but not having peace. And so they keep getting in relationships where they're going just, just going from person to person having sex with them and then expecting to have peace and to be happy, and they're not because that kind of life, it just takes away a piece of you and just throws it away, and you're just left with the shell of yourself. And um, so obviously he's not talking about physically blind they have eyes but they don't see he's not talking about they're physically blind obviously he, he's talking about spiritual sight you, you have you have eyes but you're not seeing even though i'm the one who's telling you this you're still not seeing and so the, the idea there being that they don't have understanding in both a spiritual sense and a, and a intellectual sense so then he says also right here do you not tremble before me and the thing I want to mention with this is God's control of the universe shows his control over the world, and that praise is the only reasonable response. You don't go up with someone who is literally the maker of heaven and earth and say, ha ha ha, like it's not, it's not something like, it's, it's, it's flippant. It's, it's something that you, you, and there's a sense of awe. And um, so why is God mentioning all this stuff about how he set the boundary of the sea and all this stuff? He's saying this because, yes, I did all this, and how much more so for you? Which brings us to a very interesting question. Is the fear of the Lord a good thing? Don't read the first point. That, that doesn't have anything to do with your opinion. Yes, it does. Okay, so tell me, walk me through what that looks like. Um, will fear of the Lord be a good thing? Um, it prevents you from doing like 
really bad stuff that makes your life worse. Mhm. Okay. Um for instance, um the whole sleeping around thing that you said already. Um well, g- God tells us not to do that. Uh And so um my fear of the Lord makes it where I don't do that, and then that prevents me from feeling like [noise] really terrible after I get out of my um young adult phase and into my middle age. I I don't feel like I was used or I used other people. Mhm. I don't feel like um part of me is missing because of those other people I was uh was close with. Right. Different things like that, and I feel like it prevents us from getting hurt in our life. Okay, so if you ha- with that with that being said, if you had to define the fear of the Lord, how would you define it? Um I think it's 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 not like a fear of like, oh, I'm so scared of God, he's gonna he's going to destroy me or um make me pay for what I've done. It's more like a reverence, like a like a respect type fear thing. Where you 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 understand that God has your best interest in mind and that you respect and honor, and fear that if you overstep your boundaries that he's gonna discipline you like he did, like a parent would. Okay, that makes sense. Uh I I totally agree. It's just yeah, I think you were gonna say something. I was gonna say, I feel like it's like being scared of like a parent in a way, being like I know that this is bad and I shouldn't do it, but it's like you're not necessarily actually scared of your parents. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I I I think that I think that makes sense. Uh Nikolle were you gonna say anything? No? Okay, uh something that I wanted to say, and I think I think you guys already really said you know, the most important things, so I'll just kind of try to blow through this. In life, you're either going to live by what you or someone else thinks is best, or you will live by God's standard in life. That's just the kind of the way that we go. So either you're going to do something because maybe mom and dad told you to do it, or like you were talking about, or because um, you're married to somebody or dating somebody who you you think that they wouldn't like it, or you there's somebody that you look up to, or you just kind of think, I, I'll, I'll know what the right thing is to do. Whatever it is, you're living by a person's standard of what they think is best, or you're going to live by God's standard. And God's standard doesn't always make sense to us, and oftentimes it irritates us. I mean, think of, for instance, how the world around us says love is love. This is a great example. And so in our, by our definition, yeah, love is love. That makes sense. Like that's something we can follow. That's something I can just set my, guide my own star. I can set my own standards. This makes sense. But then, you know, then God says, no, love is not love. These are the, these are the boundaries for love. And it's like, oh, well, you know, I don't really like that. And it, it's something that kind of rubs us the wrong way. We don't really like to uh, submit and we don't really like to do things that doesn't feel natural to us. We like to go more by our, by our feelings on other things. So uh, Jeremiah faced people, and I want you to get this, Jeremiah faced people who hated him and they intended harm to him, but instead of being quiet out of fear of them, he obeyed God out of fear of him as the absolute authority. See, there were, there were two sources of fear. He could have listened to either one. People who can be very intimidating. They get up all up in your business. They, they, they say a bunch of things. That you, it's, it gets very intimidating sometimes. He could have gave, given into that. I mean, these were people who were throwing him into a cistern and, and, and doing bad things to him. Or he could have feared God. And it's the same thing each of us have in life. I mean, how many of you have been intimidated by people either online or, or you know, people at Walmart or people at a at a, at a counseling session or something like that? I mean, we've all been in situations where, like, this is very intimidating. I don't really want to be here. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I, I've been intimidated on the stage. I mean, I hate being in front of people. I just hate it. And uh, yet, <laughs> I'm always finding myself in situations where I'm in front of people. And uh, so, the, so the thing is, you can either you can either follow you know that fear, which will lead you to more fear, or you can follow with God, and it doesn't. The one who God is the one who can punish in this life and the next, and He's the one who's worthy of obedience. So the question being, why should we fear men? And so the fear of the Lord is living by His standard. That would be considered the fear of the Lord. It's considering eternal consequences. That is also the fear of the Lord when you're doing things with. Um, with eternity in mind, that's the fear of the Lord, not just living for now. Like everything in the world around us is about the immediate, right? So we're doing this. Be- why shouldn't I do this? Because it's, it, I'm living my best life. Why shouldn't I get a divorce if there is no next life? See, but as a Christian, when, when, when we're taking eternity into view, it's like, okay, well, now I have to forgive people. It's not just about my instant gratification. So let's see what else. 
if you fear the Lord, you don't have to fear men. That's something that is uh, absolute standard for us. We don't have to live in the fear of men. And that Jeremiah already talked earlier in the book about how um, he could either choose to be afraid of people, in which case God would let him be afraid of people, or he could fear God. That was in chapter 1. If you fear the Lord, you honor him, consider his opinion before you act, and you submit to him. Or another way of submitting is you give way to. So fearing the Lord only for the... Uh, if, if you notice in the, in the, in the prophecies that we've looked at, um, God talks about the fear of the Lord in the most basic of senses. Fear the Lord because of the consequences. And that's the most basic reason to fear the Lord, because bad things will happen if you don't. In contrast to fearing the Lord because of who he is. So God isn't even telling them to, to be, hey, fear me for the right reasons. He's saying, hey, fear me for the very basic reason that if you don't, bad things will happen. So, fear is the proper response to God. And, and, and not just in the sense that Gracie meant it. It's also, I think, uh, the fear of the Lord can also be something that, that um, can cause fear. You know, um, for instance, um, I was in this one... And this one, uh, one service, it was super uncomfortable because there was this person who was giving a, a giving a false word about how God said this or that and the other thing. And in the middle of that false word, another word was given that basically contradicted it and said, no, that's not from God. This is not good. And as soon as that word was given, there's just this heavy atmosphere that just settled in the building. And everybody suddenly got very quiet and uncomfortable. It, 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 days after the fact, I was still feeling very uncomfortable, and it was just like this descent. And it was like it, it was like this intense, uh, intense feeling and fear, and uh, it was very uncomfortable. And uh, so I think yes, there are certain situations where um, the fear of the Lord is actually fear, not that it should be that uh, in most situations. Um, I would since Josie brought up the thing about it being compared to parents, I'd like to run on that. Um, think about um, if your mom and dad got really mad. And, uh, you know, maybe started punching the wall or something like that. It's okay. A little intimidating here. <laughs> okay, we're good. Peace, truce. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> uh, okay, so Jeremiah 5, 24 through 27. I don't remember where I stopped on, so can you read that? They have not said to themselves, What fear the Lord our God, who gives the seasonal rains, both autumn and spring, who guarantees to us the fixed weeks of the harvest. Your guilty acts have diverted these things from you. Your sins have withheld my bounty from you. Your wicked men live among my people. They watch my countries lying in wait. They set a trap, they catch men. Like a cage full of birds, so their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have grown powerful and rich. So, I kind of lost the plot of what was going on in this verse when I was sitting for this. So, I just kind of want to help you see here the people who are setting the trap and their houses are full of deceit and whatnot um he's talking with those people are these people right here watch um wicked men live among my people the wicked men who live among them are the people that he is talking about so who are these wicked people who live among them um they were people okay so let me say it like this israel was doing wrong but they were allowing people who were doing wrong to have influence in their life i could i could say like this, and I think it would be a lot clearer. Um, there was a church that I had gone to um, at one point, um, not um, gone to in the sense of I had been there, but I mean, um, I was partly responsible for bringing the solution to the problem. Um, and uh, the problem was that there was a board member who was very corrupt, and he held a lot of power in the church and a lot of sway, and uh, he had a lot of influence and, and, and stuff, and he was causing a lot of problems for the pastor that was there and just the, the whole situation. And um, the bad things were happening. He was uh, mishandling the funds. He was, uh, you know, profiting from basically using using the church as his piggy bank so he could profit. I mean, things were just not going very well. And um, yet at the end of the day, the church didn't care because the church wasn't living for God either. And so they kind of allowed this person who was a wicked person to have um, influence among them. And that's kind of exactly what, what it's talking about here. Your guilty acts have diverted these things from you. Your sins have withheld my bounty from you. For wicked men have live among my people. So kind of think of it like that. Um, another thing is it says here they set a trap to catch men. Um, the rich have taken advantage of others, and it has caused them to get rich. It's kind of like which happened first, the chicken or the egg? Both of them. People are taking advantage, advantage of others, which is making them rich. And they're rich because they're taking advantage of others. So just kind of a cluster cuss of things not going well. Uh, let me see. 
Okay, uh, Gracie, can you be that one? So I become fat and sleek. Um, they have also excelled in evil matters. They have not taken up cases uh, such as the case of the fatherless, so they m might uh, prosper. And they have not defended um, the rights of the needy. Should I not punish them for these signs? This is the Lord's declaration. Should I not avenge, um, avenge myself on such a nation as this? Hmm. Um, an appalling, horrible thing has taken place in the land. The prophets prophesy, uh, prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own authority. My people love it like this. But uh, what will you do in, at the end of it? So that takes us to the end of the second prophecy, and that's the last we're going to look at because that, that finishes off chapter 5. And so when he says here they have become fat, he's not talking about physical weight. <laughs> he's, not, he's, not, he's not saying that they're overweight. It's more of they are overindulged, fat on wealth, fat on pleasure, fat on physical possessions. Um, and it, it's, it's funny that when people get to this point, prosperity often leads to ignoring others. But also, um, so does suffering. The more you suffer, the more you kind of tend to ignore other people. I'm the only one going through this. So it's not something that I guess only the rich uh, suffer with. Uh, so a good example of that would be like poor people, for instance, ignore that the rich people have needs because all they can see is physical reality. I am financially less off than this person, so they don't have any needs, and I only have needs. Same thing. So, uh, okay, let's see what else. So just a few things I want to mention. We don't really want pleasure. Um, think about it like this. And uh, I was actually talking to a, a woman who was very unsatisfied in life because she thought that if she could stop all the problems that she was having, that she'd be happy. If she could just you know, stop the relentless march of life. But you can't start, stop the rel relentless march of life. So the point being, how do you make peace with it? And one of the things that we talked about is the way that if you didn't have to work and you got to lay down on the couch all day, every day, you would not be happy. You would be restless. You would be unhappy. You would live your life in regret. And they lived how they wanted, and they got what they wanted, but they found out after they got it that it wasn't really what they wanted. And that's kind of how pleasure works. Um, there was another woman who hated her husband. I mean, so much she hated her husband. And uh, she, they kept talking about divorce, but then they never actually did. And so finally what ended up happening is uh, he died. And after he died, she was really sad that he died. And that was the thing that she wanted, but then that he died, she didn't want it anymore. And that's kind of what I'm talking about is sometimes we think that there's this thing that's going to make us happy. And if, if we could just get that thing, and then it doesn't actually make us happy. And then the cost for Israel was too high for the things that they thought they wanted. They thought, oh, I could live my life on my terms, but it came with the curses from God. So it's like, not really what I want. Uh, and then who or what we worship decides our actions. And here's the thing about um, about idolatry for us nowadays we have to times say well i don't have idols in my house i don't even know how this even has anything to do with me here's the thing everybody worships something and idolatry causes immorality what you worship causes your sin um so uh, for them they were worshiping other gods like you know baal but for us, we oftentimes worship other things. So maybe we worship a politician, or maybe we worship um, our pride or our ego. Um, you know, there, we all have different things that we worship. Some of us it's money. Some of us it's logic or, or science. We all have different things that we worship, and we see as the absolute, you know, fount. We 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 adore it. We give all our time and thought into it. We live by its standards. And what we worship changes our beliefs, and then after it changes our beliefs, it changes our actions. It kind of starts a domino effect rolling. And uh, so a good example of, of, of how, how idolatry causes immorality is religious people are much more likely to volunteer for, for different, um, different events, the different things to help people. That's a good example of how what we worship affects our behavior, which affects our, um, our actions. So you believe in God, so then you volunteer because you believe that you were made with a purpose, and then you act on that belief by volunteering. So uh, <clears throat> they wanted to be lied to. And this is something that I think kind of hits most generations, is everybody wants to be lied to a little bit. Um, we, we, we do really do the same self-absorbed things. We, 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 we listen to all kinds of, of lies. You are enough. Live your truth. Love is love. Put yourself first. 
many people don't even read the Bible or go to church because they don't want to change. They want to believe what they want to believe. Actually, I've met a lot of Christians over the past five years who don't go to church. They just kind of live at home and they say, oh, no, I'm getting all that I need from this. When they haven't witnessed anybody in the last five years, they don't even really read their Bible. Um, they never uh, pray and worship God. They just kind of it's more of a lip service thing of when they have time or when they feel like it. Um, and it's something where, where somehow going to church has this magical effect on us where we seek God more with the whole heart. I can't really explain how it works, but I've seen it time and time again as a pastor. All the right things in the right way of how this person should be totally fine not going to church. And then they aren't. Like, it just doesn't make sense. It's like there's something magical about it. I can't even explain it. It's almost like the Holy Spirit works through the church. I don't have a verse to back that up, but that's what it really seems like. Um, so, uh, let's see what else to say here. And then he, he ends off that prophecy. The last thing was said, hey, they, they actually want to be deceived. They like it this way. He ended it with this, what will you do at the end of it? And the thing is, the ending of that way isn't the ending of what we want. We, we want to live life on our terms, and then we want the outcome to be something different, but it never is. Um, there was a, and this I'll finish with the story. Uh, there was a, a woman who really, really, really wanted to cheat. I mean, she really, 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 really wanted to cheat on her husband. Um, there was just all kinds of different issues there and the marriage definitely needed some help and some work anyways but so she really wanted to uh wanted to cheat and she kept going to the bible to to kind of tweak it to where she could justify what she wanted to do and she kept saying these unbiblical things and one of the things that kind of come and kind of set off alarms is she said that all sin is equal and the reason why that's why that set off alarms in my head first because it's not for instance, God said that if you mistreat children, it's better for a millstone cast on your neck and thrown into the sea. Well, that, he didn't say that about everything, <laughs> but he did say that about how you treat children. So it makes me think that different sins have different things. But the reason why she wanted to believe that all sin was equal and had the same cost to it was because she was trying to justify her adultery. And I, at first I was like, why did she say that? And then as I started to put pieces together of the conversations I was having with her, I was like, oh, right, that makes sense. Um, and so every week or so, she would have this this new idea of of you know how the Bible was somehow justifying her her you know skewed theology, and uh, I kept trying to combat it over and over again. Well, eventually, she started listening to different speakers and, and different uh, mentors who had told her these things that she wanted to believe, how she needed to get divorced and how she couldn't minister to others if she was hurt, and the only way that she could get healing is if she divorced him so that she could get with this guy that she liked. And it's like, what? Well, she started surrounding herself with these kinds of people who were counseling her like this and, and walking her in that. Why? Because she wanted to be lied to. That's why um, in Jeremiah it says that my, the, the prophets are saying the wrong thing. The priests are doing the wrong thing. They're all just – they, they have their own interests in mind. And here's the thing. My people, they, they want it that way. They want to be lied to. They want to go live however they want to live. And, um, and that's just a really good practical example of modern day how people want to be lied to. And uh, the Bible definitely rubs us the wrong way on a lot of things, but I've already kind of mentioned that. So Jeremiah it seems slightly repetitive at first glance. You know, we, we've looked at we've looked at five chapters of Jeremiah so far, and we've seen a lot of things that seem like repetition. And especially if this seem if everything that we've looked at seems very repetitive to you, I want to encourage you to go back and read Jeremiah because there's you're going to see more, and you're going to see all these little interesting nuggets that are, that are thrown in and how it all kinds of fits together and why how every single chapter has its own place. And it only seems really repetitive if you haven't really been paying attention. See, what I'm doing is I'm giving you guys a basic understanding of what's being said so you can go back and study it for yourself and, and kind of get a deeper, fuller understanding. Um, think of it as I'm drawing the outline. You guys are going back and coloring it in. Um, and. And the thing is, God was literally trying everything before punishment. So why does it sound so repetitive? Because God keeps trying over and over and over again to do anything for them to punish. He brought small punishments. I mean, repent. He brought small punishments. He brought, uh, you know, words and harsh words and soft words and all kinds of different things. Prophets and, and he brought all these different things and they're just like not having it. And uh, he doesn't want his people to be just good people or righteous enough to not be punished. He wants the people who seek him with their whole heart. And that was the whole idea of Jesus coming. And uh, is the whole idea of the new covenant that Jeremiah talks so much about. And that new covenant is Jesus' salvation from sin. So uh, next week we'll look at Jeremiah 6, probably the whole chapter. Um, I'm really liking getting through all, uh, all these big sections. 